All right, thank you, Ashley. Um, so this is joint work with John Bastanchi, Yuval Efron, Alexander Premba, Lewen Chan, and Henry Yen. Um, John and Henry are also here, so you can also ask them questions afterwards. Um, so what we'll be concerned with here is describing the complexity of quantum input, quantum output operations. And I'll just begin by sort of reminding ourselves what it is that we do in traditional complexity theory. And then we'll see how this is not quite adequate for describing these fully quantum problems. So in traditional complexity theory, typically what we study is the computational complexity of decision problems. And these are simply computational problems that have a yes, no answer. So for example, one that's very close to our hearts in quantum is this local Hamiltonian problem. Okay. The local Hamiltonian problem where I give you a description of a local Hamiltonian and I ask you, is the grand set energy of this local Hamiltonian below some threshold A or above some threshold B? The answer to this is yes or no, and we imagine feeding this um, as a classical string to some computational device, and the device is then meant to produce the correct output. And this computational device here can act in, in various models. So I need to do like a lot of various clicking. Um, needs to, um, this computational device can, can be in various models. So this can be a classical computer, it could be a quantum computer, it could be some interactive model of computation, um, but the important thing is that even if this here is a quantum computer or some quantum interactive protocol, and this here is some like quantum inspired problem like the local Hamiltonian problem, this is really at heart still a classical thing that we're computing, right? We're computing a, a classical map from some string that describes some problem to some classical bit. And we're just studying the complexity of this classical map perhaps on a, on a quantum computer. But you know, there are more interesting things you can do with a local Hamiltonian. So for example, I could ask you, here's a local Hamiltonian, um, please apply the time evolution unitary e to the minus iht. So if we draw this in this kind of box picture, then we now imagine having some kind of computational device that receives as input a classical description of a local Hamiltonian acting on some system A, and in addition also receives an actual quantum system A. And this actual quantum system, you know, it's in some arbitrary quantum state. We don't know what that quantum state is. Maybe it's entangled with some additional system B. It's in some joint state psi. But what we want the box to do is apply this time evolution unitary. So we want that after using the box, the output state here is the time evolution unitary applied on system A, and nothing happened to system B. Okay, this seems like a, a perfectly reasonable computational task to consider. And we sort of want to say something about the complexity of, of this. But the language from traditional complexity theory doesn't even allow us to really talk about this, right? Because here the, the input type is classical here. We have the classical input and we have this additional quantum input. So it's not even quite clear how to phrase this kind of problem in the language of traditional complexity theory. So at the very least, there's some kind of like syntactic mismatch going on. And this is not like a, an isolated example. So for example, in quantum Shannon theory, um, we study optimal communication protocols. So the typical setup there is you have some, some noisy channel that you've been given, and you want to transmit information over this noisy channel. And to do so, you, know, you have some quantum input. You first run it through some encoding map that's meant to make this quantum state more noise robust in some sense. Then you run it through the noisy channel and then through some decoder which is meant to um, correct any errors that might have been introduced by the noisy channel. And now again, it seems like a, a perfectly reasonable question to ask if I give you a description of a noisy channel, how hard is it for you to implement this encoder and decoder? And Shannon theory typically studies the sort of information theoretic existence of these encoders and decoders, but of course if you actually want to run this kind of protocol in a lab, you better make sure that to run the encoder and decoder you don't need to solve some super complicated computational problem. But again, it's not clear how to, how to phrase the complexity of implementing this encoder and decoder in the language of traditional complexity because again, at the very least, there's this mismatch in, in input types. Okay, and I'll give you one final example from quantum crypto. So in quantum crypto, there's a, a notion called quantum commitments, which we'll come back to later. And these have a property called binding. And very briefly, what binding does is, so the commitment is between two parties, Alice and Bob. Alice has some bit, zero or one, that she wants to commit to. And what she does to do so is she prepares some bipartite state on two registers. 
sends over this commit register C. And now the, um, this binding property requires that it should be computationally hard for Alice to switch from state psi zero to state psi one, so to flip the bit that she committed to by only acting on this register R that's still in her possession. And of course, if you want to use a, a quantum commitment in some sort of quantum cryptographic protocol, you sort of want to be able to say, well, breaking this is at least as hard as something else, right? Um, but breaking this for Alice means mapping one quantum state to another. Again, it's not the kind of problem that traditional complexity theory describes naturally. So I hope at this point I've at least convinced you that there's no sort of obvious way in which traditional complexity theory captures these, these fully quantum problems that have quantum inputs and quantum outputs. Now, you might still sort of wonder, well, maybe I'm just being overly pedantic here. Maybe, you know, the whole problem is that I'm, I'm talking about, I'm being too strict here in, in my input type, maybe you just need to consider this as some complicated kind of function problem, and then, then we're all fine. And this is, in principle, a, a reasonable thing to hope for, um, but it turns out to just, it seems like, at least from the evidence that we have, it turns out to be not true. And the evidence that we have is mostly from quantum crypto. So for example, at last year's QIP, Kretschmer, Chan, Xin, Yan, Tal, had this very nice paper where they show that quantum crypto can still exist even if P is equal to NP. More specifically, there's a, a primitive called pseudorandom states, which can exist in a world where P is equal to NP. What does this have to do with this sort of distinction between the complexity of unitaries and the complexity of, of decision problems? Well, the kind of interpretation is if P were equal to NP, then all of classical crypto or computational classical crypto would sort of collapse, right? Because you could always just in NP basically guess the, the solution to the cryptographic problem. And the fact that they show that even if P is equal to NP, quantum crypto can still exist kind of means that the, the unitaries that you would have to implement to break quantum cryptographic primitives don't become easy just because this decision collapse happens. Okay, so this shows some kind of statement of the form, decision problem collapse does not imply some kind of collapse in implementing unitaries. Um, this idea that there's some kind of more fundamental difference between the complexity of unitaries and the complexity of decision problems is, is not new to this work, it's definitely not new to our work. I think the first time this was sort of stated really crisply is in this paper by Aronson and Cooperberg. This is now typically called the unitary synthesis question. And what it says is, suppose we lived in a world where all the, de, all the classical functions were easy to compute in, say, one time step. Does this mean I can do any unitary efficiently in polynomially many steps? So in other words, can one implement arbitrary unitaries with queries to an arbitrarily powerful decision oracle? Um, now, you know, this is a, a question, it's not a theorem. The implicit conjecture here is that the answer is no, that indeed um, the complexity of unitaries does not reduce to the complexity of decision problems. Um, it, it's still a question because, frankly, um, we haven't made that much progress for the first, like, 15 or 16 years um, until, like, two or three months ago. Um, so Lombardi, Ma, and Wright had this very beautiful paper where they showed the first sort of meaningful progress on this, and what they showed is if you restrict this to a single query to this arbitrarily powerful decision oracle, then you cannot do um, all unitaries. Okay, so this is like still quite a bit weaker than the full unitary synthesis question where you have polynomially many queries to this decision oracle, um, but still it's, it's sort of meaningful progress towards this and kind of suggests that the answer is indeed no. And uh, Fermi is gonna give a talk about this on Friday 2 p.m. I mean, it's a very beautiful paper, so, so we should all go. Okay, so from this we're kind of forced to conclude that implementing unitaries from a complexity point of view does seem kind of inherently different from computing functions. And where does this leave us? Well, it leaves us with a kind of zoo of, of quantum problems, and I put so many here that I hope everyone can find like one that you like, and if not, you can just look at the, the pictures of bears and tigers. Um, and we have all of these problems whose complexity we can't reduce to the decision complexity world, but still we want to be able to make some meaningful statement about them, 
right? And we, we still sort of want to do complexity theory on these fully quantum problems. So concretely, um, you know, if we can't reduce them to, to decision problems, we should at least try to relate them to each other. So we should sort of consider, you know, which are efficient on a quantum computer, which problems reduce to other problems, so which are no harder than others. Um, once we have these, these reductions here, we can group them into complexity classes, ask about complete problems. We can ask what kind of assumptions you can make in this unitary complexity world that yield quantum cryptography and so on. So that's kind of what we, what we at least started doing in this paper. Um, the somewhat... Okay. The somewhat um, aspirational plan here is to take you know, all of the natural quantum input, quantum output problems um, that you encounter in condensed matter or high energy, chemistry, CS, crypto optimization, and so on, and to study their complexity formally in the same way that in traditional complexity you formalize computational problems in these languages. Um, here we, as a first step, need to formalize them into some kind of common framework, and this we call unitary synthesis problems. And I'm gonna explain on the next slide um, what they are. Once we formalize them, the plan is to you know, show reductions as we do in complexity, and classify them into classes, identify complete problems, maybe even try to prove separations, and so on. So the thing I want to stress here is that you know, this is very much not a case of we just want to open our favorite complexity theory textbook and like, pick a theorem and see whether we can like, slap unitary on either side and, and it still makes sense. Um, the goal is really to start from these complete problems and, and show reductions between them, and the framework that, that I'm gonna talk about is really meant to enable you to, to show these reductions. So, you know, this is not meant to be some like exercise in, in formal complexity theory. Okay, so for the talk, I also mostly want to focus on applications, but we do need one sort of section of, of dry theory just to establish the language um, to talk about applications. And then the main application that we'll talk about is what we call the Ullmann transformation problem. And this Ullmann transformation problem turns out to be quite central both for sort of pure quantum or unitary complexity theory as well as for applications in crypto and Shannon theory and then we'll have like half a slide on, on black holes because, well, why not? Okay, so let's start with a kind of formal language of, of unitary complexity theory. And as I said, the first thing we need to do is we need to formalize computational problems somehow so that we have some sort of language to talk about all of them together. And the way we do this is by what we call a unitary synthesis problem. So formally, a unitary synthesis problem is just some sequence of unitary operations that are indexed by bit strings. And you know, here you could associate a unitary to every bit string, or you could also just pick some kind of subset of bit strings and associate a, a unitary to, to each string in that subset. How do you see that this is like a reasonable definition of a unitary synthesis problem? I think the sort of best way to see it is by analogy to what happens in traditional complexity. So in traditional complexity, what we do is we take computational problems and we, these are yes, no problems, right? Um, these are decision problems. We encode them into a string, so now to each string you can associate a bit, which is whether it's a, a yes problem or a no problem instance. So you can view a, a problem in traditional complexity as a map from strings specifying the problem instance to yes or no specifying the problem answer. In a unitary complexity, the problem answer, if you like, is the unitary that we then want to implement on some additional quantum input. So as a result, instead of having a you know, a, a bit associated to each string specifying yes or no, we now have a unitary associated to each string specifying the unitary that we want to apply on that classical input string to some additional quantum input that will be given later. Okay, so that's what formally a, a unitary synthesis problem is. And now the sort of central question that we want to study is if we fix such a unitary synthesis problem, meaning that we all agree on you know, how to interpret this string x and then what the associated unitary ux should be, so we fix this mapping from strings to unitaries, then if I give you a string x, how hard is it for you to apply ux, the corresponding unitary, to some arbitrary quantum input? And hard here is in the usual sort of complexity theoretic sense where 
know, we consider all the strings and we sort of want to look at the asymptotic hardness as a function of the length of this, this the, the description length basically, so that the length of this string x. Okay, so that's, that's what we want to study. All right, let's look at some examples just to get a feel for this, this concept of unitary synthesis. So um, here's a, a very uninteresting one. So we could all agree that x is a gate by gate encoding of a quantum circuit and that ux should just be the unitary implemented by that circuit. Okay, this is a, a perfectly valid unitary synthesis problem. It specifies some, some set of strings and associates to, to each string a unitary. How hard is it to solve this unitary synthesis problem? Well, it's pretty easy to do on a polynomial time quantum computer, right? What I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna read the string and do the gates gate by gate as they're specified here. And this I can definitely do in time that's actually linear in, in the length of this string x. Okay, so this is a unitary synthesis problem that can be solved in polynomial time and we call these unitary DQP. This is just the set of all unitary synthesis problems implementable on a polynomial time quantum computer. Okay, so this was a, a bit of a silly example. Um, another slightly silly example, um, but that's, that's instructive, is to sort of see how we can embed decision problems into unitary synthesis problems. So we could now all agree um, that we want to interpret the string X as the encoding of some BQP decision problem. So some decision problem that's efficiently solvable on a quantum computer. And this decision problem is described by some function F of X, which maps the string to like, let's say zero means no, or one means yes, depending on the answer to the decision question. And now we can associate a unitary ux with each string here, and the unitary that we could pick is just if the string x is a no instance, so f of x is zero, then the unitary should just be the identity map, and if the, the x string here encodes a yes instance of the decision problem, then the unitary should be the, the phase flip, the pali z. Okay, so the succinct way of writing this is like pali z to the power zero one, where to the power zero means identity matrix. How hard is it to solve this unitary synthesis problem? Well, again, it's in unitary BQP, right? How am I gonna solve it? Well, first, I'll just, I'll get the string X, I'll solve the decision problem on my quantum computer. Now I have a bit, and I'm just gonna look and either apply a Pauli Z or, or I don't. This is not too hard, right? And you can play the same game for like BQP space, which are decision problems you can do in quantum polynomial space. Um, and then you get a, a class called unitary P space, which are all the unitaries that require quantum polynomial space to implement. And as a final example, we can also go back to the, the thing I had on the very first slide. Um, so we could interpret X as an explicit encoding of some local Hamiltonian and say that the associated unitary that we want to do is the time evolution e to the minus um, I H X. How hard is this? Well, again, this is efficiently doable by Hamiltonian simulation, right? It's, it's efficiently doable in a, a, a sort of circuit size that's polynomial in the description length of this Hamiltonian. Okay, so I hope at this point it's sort of fairly clear what these unitary synthesis problems are and, and, and why we're interested in them. And we'll need one kind of variant of this, which are average case unitary synthesis problems. So, you know, so far, um, I required you to solve the unitary synthesis problem. I asked you to implement this unitary on an arbitrary input quantum system. And it turns out to be useful um, for, for many applications to relax this a little bit and only require you to do well sort of on average over some specific ensemble of states. This is a, also something that is, is very typical in, in decision problems. And the way to formalize this um, is that now in addition to the ux for each string x, in addition to the ux that um, you're supposed to implement, we also specify some probability distribution over possible input quantum states. Okay, so this px here is a probability distribution over the set of quantum states. And now the goal, instead of given x, apply ux, the goal now is given x, apply some unitary that sort of acts, you know, like ux in some, some well-defined sense on average over this ensemble of, of quantum states. Okay, so this, this is a sort of slight relaxation of this, this worst case notion of unitary synthesis. 
All right, the final um, concept that we'll need is that of reductions, and this is, of course, really what, what complexity theory is all about. So we want to say something like, you know, ux reduces to vx, where ux and vx are meant to be unitary synthesis problems. And what we want this sentence to mean morally is that if we could solve this problem v here efficiently, then we could also solve u efficiently. Okay, note that if you're not, if you haven't seen reductions before, this makes no statement about whether we can solve v efficiently, right? v here could be some, some super hard unitary synthesis problem. All it says is, in a world where I could do v, which doesn't have to be the world you're in, then I could also do u efficiently. Okay, how do we formalize this? Um, this is formalized by what are called oracle circuits. So, um, more precisely, if ux reduces to vx, what this means is that we have an efficient algorithm for u if we are allowed what we call oracle gates for the unitary synthesis problem v. And an oracle gate is just a gate that applies one of these unitaries vx here in one time step. So your algorithm for the unitary synthesis problem u will now look like, you know, like this, where you have some of the, the normal quantum gates that we're used to, like C0s and, and Pauli's. But then every once in a while you can have like a special oracle gate which applies one of these, these unitaries from the sequence V. And this here counts as, as one time step, irrespective of how difficult it actually is to implement the, the unitary VY, you know, in, in reality. And you can, in this oracle circuit, you can specify the index of the V. So the reduction will just output, you know, which V it wants to implement for this gate and will output which V it wants to implement from this gate, and this can depend on the string X. Okay, so this is something that reduction computes you can use like Vs of, of various um, sizes inside your circuit. Okay, so that's um, all we need in terms of pure theory. So let's just recap. Um, unitary synthesis problems are these sequences of unitary operations that we want to implement. We've seen this average case notion where I only require you to do the unitary sort of well on average over some fixed ensemble. And we've seen reductions which allow us to say UX is, you know, no harder to do than, than Vx up to polynomial overhead. Okay, so let's move on towards applications. And the main application that I want to talk about is this Ullmann transformation problem. So let's begin by just, you know, stating what this problem is. And as you might have guessed, um, it sort of arises out of Ullmann's theorem. So, I guess we all know and love Ullmann's theorem, but in, in, case, in case not, here it is. Um, what Ullmann's theorem says is, if we have two um, pure quantum states, psi and phi, that are bipartite on systems A and B, and suppose I, like, give you state, I give you register A of state phi, and you're allowed to do any arbitrary unitary on register A then you sort of try to find the unitary that, after applying it to phi, maximizes the overlap with psi. Okay, so this is this, this maximum on the left here, and what Ullmann's theorem says is that um, this maximized quantity is the same as the fidelity between the reduced states of psi and phi on the, the register B that you weren't allowed to act on. Okay, fidelity, if you haven't seen it, it's some measure of, of distance between mixed states. Okay, the theorem itself is not terribly important for us. What's important is the, the left-hand side here, because if you look at this from a sort of computational point of view, um, a very natural definition to make is to say, okay, now if I have two bipartite states, psi and phi, I want to define, I want to associate a unitary with these two bipartite states. And the unitary that I want to associate is the unitary that maximizes um, this, this expression here. Okay, so this we call an Ullmann transformation for the state pair. These are two bipartite states. It's a unitary that achieves the maximum in this, this variational formula. There's a, a slight hitch here, which is that this is not necessarily unique. Um, th there's a way to resolve it, so for the talk, we'll just pretend that this is always a, a uniquely defined quantity. Okay, if you haven't seen Ullmann's theorem before, this might seem like a, a rather arbitrary definition to make. Um, but these Ullmann transformations um, show up literally everywhere. So in quantum Shannon theory, optimal decoders arise from Ullmann transformation. Quantum state compression uses Ullmann transformation. Entanglement distillation uses Ullmann transformations. 
um, in um, computational complexity, implementing optimal provers in QIP protocols is basically just applying Ullman transformations. In crypto, breaking binding, which we've seen on one of the first slides, is basically just an Ullman transformation, breaking something called unclonable state generators is Ullman, and even it turns out decoding black hole Hawking radiation is, is also just applying Ullman transformations. Okay, so these are everywhere, and as a result, we would really like to understand the comp computational complexity of implementing this unitary of given descriptions of these two states. Okay, so let's do what I sort of had on this aspirational slide as, as our second step. We've now identified a, a natural problem that we want to study, so we need to formalize it as a unitary synthesis problem. And here it is. We just call it the Ullman transformation problem, or, you know, capital Ullman. Um, it's a sequence of unitaries, as, as we said. And now we interpret X here as a circuit description for two bipartite states. I'm calling them C and D here because we imagine the circuits being called C and D, and these are just the output states of these two circuits on the all zero input. And the circuit description here you should also sort of imagine includes, um, like it also tells us where the cut is between systems A and B, right? So just imagine it's like a circuit that has some number of output qubits and it just tells you there's a cut between the first like 12 qubits and the remaining qubits or something like this. Okay, that's how we want to interpret the string X. And then the associated unitary UX should be the Ullman transformation um, between these two, these two states acting on say system A. Okay, so I hope we can all agree this is, at the very least, it's a, a well-defined unitary synthesis problem, and, you know, judging by the, okay, I can't go back, judging by the, the list of, of applications I had on the previous slide, it seems like a unitary synthesis problem um, worth studying. Okay, so, you know, how, how hard is this? Um, you know, maybe it's just easy. So, here, let's imagine we, we have a gate-by-gate -gate circuit description. Then the string X here, you know, if it's gate by gate, this means that these circuit, uh, these states C and D, they're not terribly complex in, in the description length X, right? I just do them gate by gate. I know e each gate, so maybe because these states are like pretty simple to prepare, maybe the Ullman transformation is, is also just easy to do. Um, that seems reasonable. Um, it's, it's not true though, so here's a, a counterexample. Um, Suppose you pick some injective one-way function. Let's call it f. And an injective one-way function is just some injective function that's easy to compute in the forward direction, but that's hard to invert. And now I want to define two states, and I want to look at the Ullman transformation between them. And the two states I'm going to define are these c and d. So c is going to be the uniform superposition. I, I didn't normalize it, but it's a uniform superposition over all cats x on the, the second system and then f of x on the first system. And d is just the, the maximally entangled state. Okay, I hope we can agree that both of these states are easy to prepare because f here is a function that's easy to compute in the forward direction, so I can, I can efficiently prepare this state and I can definitely make this state efficiently. But now what would be the Ullman transformation between these two on the first subsystem? Well, let's just think, think for a second. So it has to map c to be like as close to D as possible while only acting on the first subsystem. But this can be done perfectly, right, because F is injective, so you've like lost no information in some sense by applying it here. I can just take each value F of X and, you know, output the corresponding X, and if I apply this to the first subsystem of C, I get back exactly D. Okay, so this tells you that this is indeed the Ullman unitary because it achieves optimal, like it achieves overlap one between these two states. But now what is, what is this unitary? Well, it's a unitary that for each input f of x gives us the pre-image under f of that value. Um, but what does that mean? Well, it, it means it just inverts the function f, really, right? This is what the unitary does. If I put in any y, I get the pre-image of y under the function f. And we said f was one way, which means you can't invert it efficiently. So even though this unitary, like, it's, it's kind of simple to write down, it's not something that you can efficiently implement if you believe that one-way functions are indeed one-way. Okay, so from this we conclude that Ullman transformations are at least as hard as inverting these injective one-way functions. Okay, so that's a start, you know, I know 
we know that at least under like plausible crypto assumptions, it's not easy. Um, but here we're still sort of in the, the mindset of traditional complexity where we try to reduce stuff to like traditional like function type problems, right? What we're really after is some kind of equivalent statement. So we want to say not if they're injective one-way functions, then Ullmann is hard, but we want to say Ullmann is exactly as hard as, or Ullmann is some complete problem for some class. And this you can't really do using traditional complexity. So in particular, there's no assumption in traditional complexity that you can make, even something like truly wild, like P is equal to P space. Um, even if you assume that, you couldn't, um, or at least we don't know how, to imply Ullmann transformations efficiently. And that again goes back to this unitary synthesis question of Aronson and Cooperberg, because P is equal to P space, say, just means I can now efficiently compute all functions that require polynomial space to compute, but we don't really know how to make use of improved ability to compute classical functions in order to implement unitaries more efficiently. Okay, so that's, that's really the, the, the root of the problem here. Okay, so this is kind of, you know, bad news. In some sense, it's good news for us because it also turns out that Ullmann is a complete problem for a natural unitary complexity class. And this is what I want to talk about next, this sort of complexity theoretic characterization in terms of this unitary complexity of the Ullmann problem. Okay, so we'll have one slide here which just lists all the complexity theoretic results on Ullmann. And we are aware that this like, looks like a parody of complexity theory where everything is just like a, an alphabet soup. Um, so it's, it's one slide, bear with me, I'll point out the, the important features. Um, and you can also just ignore it and, and wait for applications which come on the next slide. Okay, so the first thing we prove is that this Ullmann transformation problem is complete for a class called average unitary SEK. What's average unitary SEK? Well, firstly, it's an average unitary class. So really here I'm talking about some kind of average case version of Ullmann. Okay, so we've, we've dealt with the average. Um, if you know what SEK is, it stands for statistical zero knowledge, then you can just imagine this as some kind of suitable unitary version of that. Um, if you don't know what SEK is, then there's an even more vague um, way of saying it. You can imagine unitary SEK as all unitaries that a verifier can implement with the help of an untrusted prover in such a way that the verifier kind of learns no more useful information about the unitary except for what he learns from having it applied to his input state. Okay, so it's some kind of like zero knowledge version of, of applying a unitary, some interactive model. Now really the important feature for the rest of this talk of, of unitary SEK is that we believe it's strictly larger than unitary BQP. And that's because SEK or QSEK is larger than BQP. Okay, so what this means is Ullmann is complete for a class which includes problems that we don't think are efficiently doable. So this is the kind of thing that we were after on the previous slide. It's an equivalent statement that says Ullmann is easy if and only if average unitary SEK were equal to average unitary BQP, which we don't believe. Okay, so that characterizes the complexity of Ullmann. Um, we can also look at a variant of this Ullmann problem um, that we call succinct Ullmann. And this is the same except now the circuits for these states C and D, which previously we had gate by gate descriptions for, we now have what are called succinct descriptions for. This, so this means that the string X, which previously told you just, you know, apply a C naught here, apply a Hadamard here, and so on, is now some encoding for some classical Turing machine that then prints out the circuit on demand. And this is a more succinct way of describing a circuit because now I can have a, a sort of short description for a Turing machine that prints out an exponentially long circuit. So as a result, this succinct Ullmann problem here allows you to ask for Ullmann transformations between much more complex states than the, the non-succinct version. And as a result, we would imagine that the succinct Ullmann problem is, is more difficult to solve. And indeed, we prove it's complete for a class called average unitary P space, which are all the unitaries that you can do with quantum polynomial space. And again, average unitary P space, we believe to be strictly and, and probably like vastly larger than average unitary SEK, just because P space is, is larger than SEK. Okay, um, we also prove sort of separately that this succinct Ullmann problem is complete for what we call average unitary QIP, which are unitaries that I can implement by interacting over multiple rounds with some untrusted but all powerful quantum prover. 
And if you put these two things together, what you get immediately is that these two classes are in fact equal. So a kind of nice high-level feature here is that even though we came at this Ullman problem from a, a sort of practical um, direction, you know, having proven these two things independently allows us to, to get this purely complexity theoretic statement that now doesn't talk about Ullman at all. So it's a, a kind of useful proof, proof tool as well. Okay, so this gives a, a sort of fairly good characterization of the problem uh, of the complexity of Ullman. Again, the important takeaways are there's the problem Ullman, which is complete for a class that we think is strictly larger than unitary BQP. And there's this version called succinct Ullman, which is complete for a class that we believe is you know, strictly larger than unitary SEK. So you should imagine this is inefficient and this is like really, really inefficient to do. Okay, so let's move on to, to actual applications. I promised applications, but so far the application that we had was, was relatively abstract. And let's begin by returning to this, this notion of, of quantum commitments that we had on one of the first slides. So just to recap, how did a commitment work? We had Alice and Bob. Alice wanted to commit to a bit, zero or one. The way she did this was to prepare some bipartite state and send over this, this register C to Bob. So this is called the commitment phase, and the sort of security property that we want to have from this commitment phase, and this I didn't mention on the first slide, is called statistical hiding. This just means that if you look at Bob's reduced state here, then the states for psi zero and psi one should be close in trace distance. What does that mean sort of from a crypto point of view? It means that if I'm Bob, and you know, I might be, might be computationally unbounded, I'm Bob, I get this register C from Alice. Now, I might want to know what Alice committed to because I'm curious, um, but these, these two reduced states are the same, so no matter what computation I do, just from my reduced state, I can't tell which bit Alice committed to. That's why it's called hiding, it's hiding the bit. Okay, and then in the second phase, Alice will also, she now wants to reveal the commitment to Bob, she wants to open it, she will send over this, this register R2, and then Bob can determine which bit Alice committed to just like opening a sort of locked box. And for this stage, the, the property that we want is this computational binding, which tells us that you know, at this stage where um, we had this, this shared system, there's no computationally efficient um, operation that Alice can do to switch from psi zero to psi one. So she's bound to the choice of bit that she made um, at the start. Okay, so, these are the sort of two relevant properties of quantum commitments. If you haven't seen this before, you might be slightly bothered by this asymmetry between statistical and computational here. So the first thing we should sort out, and this will also get us back to Ullman, is, you know, is, is this really necessary? Maybe we can just have like a, a commitment that is statistical in, in both hiding and binding. So in other words, if Alice were computationally unbounded, would it always be possible for her to switch between psi zero and psi one? And the answer to this is, is yes, and this is a famous result of Lo and Shao and Myers. Um, and here's a proof, it's a, it's a very simple proof. Um, so, you know, we want to say if Alice is unbounded, she can switch between these two states. And the first thing we observe is that by statistical hiding, these two reduced states are the same. So their fidelity is, is one. And now we use Ullmann's theorem. And Ullmann's theorem tells us that the fidelity between these two reduced states is the maximum overlap between the purifications, which are, you know, these psi zero and psi one on registers R and C, if I'm allowed to apply arbitrary unitaries on R. Okay, so this maximum now is equal to one, but what does this mean? This means that there exists some unitary on R that Alice can apply because that's her system that maps psi zero to psi one. Okay, so this, this shows you that indeed if Alice were unbounded, she could switch between two, these two states. And really what does she have to do to, to switch between the states? Well, she has to implement the Ullmann transformation between these two, two states that um, she produced in her commitment on register R. Okay, so now you know, we have a more formal way of, of making the statement, which is that if the Ullmann transformation problem were an average unitary BQP, so in other words, if it were efficiently solvable, 
then quantum commitments do not exist because then Alice could always implement this unitary and, and break the commitment. Okay, so that's a, a one-way um, implication. Um, the nice thing about unitary complexity is that we can also do the other way. So suppose um, Ullmann was not an average unitary BQP. You know, this is actually what we, what we believe to be true in, in reality, um, though we have, have no formal proof. Um, suppose it were not an average unitary BQP, then we can use kind of hard instances of the Ullmann transformation problem to construct some like weak version of quantum commitments. And then you can amplify this, this weak version to like a, a sort of normal or, or full quantum commitment scheme using a, a recent amplification result by Bastanchi, Chan, Spooner, and Yuan, which uh, John will talk about Friday at 10 a.m. So that's another talk to, to attend. Okay, so what do we get from this? Well, we get this equivalence that quantum commitments exist if and only if Ullmann is, in, is not an average unitary BQP. But also remember that on our slightly horrendous um, like complexity slide, we proved that uh, Ullmann is also complete for average unitary SEK. Okay, so you can now put these, this fact and this fact together to get a, a sort of purely complexity theoretic characterization of the existence of quantum commitments, which is that quantum commitments exist if and only if unitary SEK is not the same as unitary BQP. Okay, now in fairness, there's like a lot of fine print here which I'm ignoring, so it's, it's not quite a theorem, but it, morally this is, is what the theorem says. And, you know, why, why do we like this kind of theorem? We like it because it reestablishes this link between quantum crypto and quantum complexity that was kind of lost in these, these scratch mat R results that showed that even if P is equal to NP, crypto still exists, quantum crypto still exists. You know, that, that broke what we would expect the relationship between complexity and crypto to be. And, you know, the sort of implicit claim here is that unitary complexity is really the, the right sort of flavor of complexity to make statements about the hardness of breaking quantum crypto. And indeed, if we use that kind of complexity, then we get a very close link between complexity and crypto. Okay, so this talked about the existence of quantum commitments, which are a very sort of central um, primitive in quantum crypto. But, you know, you could still ask, well, maybe we do live in a world where average unitary SEK is equal to average unitary BQP. Then quantum commitments do not exist, but, you know, maybe other quantum crypto can still exist. What we can also show, though, is a sort of upper bound on pretty much any generic um, quantum cryptographic assumption or more specifically, um, an upper bound, like a sort of statement of the form, you know, if, what will it, it will be like unitary p-space is equal to unitary bqp, if that is the case, then there's no what is called falsifiable quantum crypto assumption. Very briefly, briefly, what's a falsifiable assumption? It's an assumption where I can be convinced in an interactive game with an efficient challenger that the assumption is false. So, for example, binding is a falsifiable assumption because if I'm Alice and I think I have a computationally binding scheme, you know, Bob can come along and, and, and be like, well, I, I don't think so. And how is Bob going to convince me? Well, I'm going to send over the, the register R to Bob. He's going to do, you know, something, send back register R. And now I'm going to check whether he managed to flip between the bits 0 and 1. And if indeed my computational binding property was broken, then what I would find, and I, you know, on my PowerPoint, this looks like a more reasonable emoji, but um, you know, it's, it's meant to be Alice being very dismayed. Um, Alice will find out that indeed Bob managed to switch from psi um, zero to phi one and vice versa, and therefore that um, the binding property was broken. Okay, so this is some interactive game where Bob convinced Alice that her assumption was, was false. Now, morally, you don't need the, the definition here in detail. Morally, basically, any reasonable assumption is falsifiable. There are non-falsifiable assumptions. The most famous one is called knowledge of exponent. Um, these are like considered slightly dubious. Um, so we'll, we'll usually try to stick in crypto to these falsifiable assumptions. OK, now what can we prove? Um, what we can prove is that if the succinct Ullmann problem, which remember was this much harder version of Ullmann where now I give you succinct um, circuit descriptions for the states, 
if this much harder version of Ullmann was still an average unitary BQP, then no computational falsifiable quantum crypto could exist. Okay, so the, the existence of commitments was based on if Ullmann, the normal Ullmann, is an average unitary BQP, which is a sort of, we don't believe it's true, but it's more plausible. This is really quite implausible because it would mean that um, you know, average unitary p-space, which is the class for which this is complete, were equal to average unitary BQP, meaning everything I can do in, in polynomial time, I can do in polynomial space, which, which doesn't seem quite right. Okay, so this is, this is a sort of complexity theoretic upper bound on the existence of any quantum crypto, or any falsifiable quantum crypto. Very briefly, how do we prove this? I don't want to explain this in detail, I just want to give you a sort of flavor of where where the Ullmann problem comes in, because it's, it's maybe not obvious. What you do is you take this interactive protocol that's in the definition of a falsifiable assumption. You purify it, meaning you just dilate all the actions that Alice and Bob do. And then what you can do is you can show that all the intermediate states are in a state class called state P space. And that you can write the actions of, opt of an optimal prover in this interactive protocol as Ullmann transformations between these intermediate states. And then you show sort of independently that Ullmann transformations between state p-space states are efficiently doable um, using succinct Ullmann. Okay, so really where Ullmann comes in here is sort of from this general statement that implementing optimal provers and interactive protocols um, can be done using Ullmann. Okay, let me give you one final application which is from Shannon theory. Um, so in Shannon theory, as I said earlier, we usually have a noisy channel. We want to like find encoders or decoders. And the simplest instance of this is what we call the decodable channel problem, where if I give you a channel N, um, I want to find a decoder such that the concatenation maps to the identity channel. So we call it channel decodable if such a decoder exists that, uh, that approximately inverts N. And I drew the two arrows here to, to mean, you know, even if I put in like half of an entangled state and I keep the purifying register around, um, then this still is the same as the identity channel. Okay, so the decodable channel problem is then if I give you a circuit description of such a decodable channel, find the optimal decoder. And what we prove is that, you know, this decodable channel problem being efficiently solvable in general is equivalent to Ullmann being an average unitary BQP. So again, you know, because we don't believe this is true, this also means that this decodable channel problem is going to be hard in, in general. Again, very briefly, how does Ullmann come in? Uh, we have two directions to show if Ullmann is easy, then decoding is easy. This I'm not going to say much about. There's a set of techniques called decoupling that sort of get decoders from Ullmann, Ullmann's theorem, and, and this is where Ullmann comes in here. The other direction is a bit more intuitive, maybe. So if Ullmann is hard, then commitments exist, and if commitments exist, you can kind of construct a contrived commitment channel where decoding the channel is the same as breaking the commitment. And, and you know, this is how you, how you do the O minus hard decoding as hard direction. Okay, now here's the, the promised half slide on black holes. Um, so there's a black hole radiation problem, which um, very briefly is the following. You have a black hole, you have a bipartite quantum state, you throw in half of that state into the black hole, you keep the other half to yourself, you wait for like a few billion years, the black hole is gonna like radiate out Hawking radiation, and you go around the universe collecting all the Hawking radiation. Okay, so now after like a lot of travel, what you have is your original half of the quantum system and all of this Hawking radiation, and what you want to do is you want to recover the original quantum state before you threw in half uh, into the black hole. Um, this was formalized in this famous paper by Patrick Hayden and Daniel Harlow, and what they showed is that um, if you could do this efficiently, like this decoding operation, if you could do efficiently, then SEK is contained in BQP, which we don't believe is, is true, SEK being statistical zero knowledge. But what they couldn't show us is an equivalence, because again, they ran basically into this unitary synthesis question barrier where no assumption they could make in traditional complexity made this decoding task here easy. Um, this we can fix in unitary complexity because, you know, basically this black hole radiation um, problem is like a rephrasing of this decodable channel problem where now the channel kind of comes from the black hole. 
So what we show as a, a direct corollary of what I had on the previous slide whoops, um, is that if this were, um, if you could do this efficiently, that's equivalent to unitary SCK being the same as unitary BQP. And I'll point out that um, um, Zika Bukowski has a, a very nice paper that sort of goes into much more detail on this, um, which he's going to talk about on Thursday, 5 p.m. Um, okay, so let me wrap up by going back to our sort of, you know, aspirational um, slide from the start. So, you know, we, we, we started, um, we didn't finish, but we started, and what we did is we provided a, a framework for talking about these questions, which is this framework for unitary complexity. And we analyzed the complexity of this Ullmann transformation problem, both as a natural complete problem for um, complexity theory and as a central problem for applications. Um, as you might imagine, there's a lot left to do. So I'll give you like my, my favorite three um, questions and then I'll have a much longer list that you can pick your own favorites from. So firstly, on the sort of crypto side, we proved if unitary P space is equal to unitary BQP, then there's no falsifiable crypto. That's a one-way implication. Really what you would hope is a, an equivalent statement. So, you know, one conjecture would be falsifiable quantum crypto existing is equivalent to unitary BQP not equal to unitary QMA, where unitary QMA, we don't even quite know how to, how to define correctly. So it's, it's a conjecture on, on two levels. Secondly, on the relation between unitary complexity and decision complexity, really the key question is this aronson Cooperberg unitary synthesis question, which asks whether unitaries are in some formal sense harder than decision problems. And with this unitary complexity framework, um, we have now like a very crisp way of, of stating this question and stating sort of scaled down versions of this question. So for example, this here says if unitary BQP to the P space, meaning it has P space decision oracle access, is this equal to unitary P space? The original one asks for like unitary BQP to the like all functions is equal to all unitaries, but this is a, a kind of scaled down version and it's a very nice and crisp way of, of stating this, this question. And finally, and you know, maybe overambitiously, for all we know right now, we could even prove unconditional separations between unitary complexity classes. So famously in like, traditional complexity theory, there are no unconditional results, or I mean, there are some, but they're like you know, no, no very meaningful ones perhaps. So we can't even prove P is not equal to P space, which is, which is maybe embarrassing. But in the unitary world, we don't know any barriers, right? If unitary BQP were equal to unitary P space, that wouldn't imply anything about decision complexity. So for all we know, there's no barrier to proving unconditional separations. It does still feel like maybe, maybe you can't. So perhaps the more realistic thing to study is, you know, do we encounter the same barriers that we do as in decision complexity? Um, but, you know, perhaps this is just a, a model of complexity where unconditional separations are possible. Okay, so these are like three concrete questions and there are a lot more sort of vague ones um, that I've sort of grouped. So firstly, of course, we should kind of populate this zoo of problems with more problems from Shannon theory or learning theory or, or whatever other field you like and show reductions between them to build up a, a more rich theory of, of unitary complexity. And I'll just put up these as, as directions and you can ask more questions if you like. Um, we could try to strengthen the link between unitary complexity and crypto, which I mentioned on the previous slide. And of course, we should understand better the, the relationship between traditional and fully quantum complexity theory. Okay, so with that, I'll stop and, and thank you for your attention. Okay, so thanks very much, Tony, for that wonderful talk. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Um, right here at the front. Maybe I'll come with the mic. So you say that uh, quantum crypto assumptions should be falsifiable, but I think pseudo random set generator is not falsifiable in your definition. Um, pseudo random set generator? Is not, does not seem to be falsifiable in your definition. Um, why not? Yeah, because challenger cannot generate high random state efficiently. That's true, that you could do something like you do it for any polynomial and then you do like polynomial t designs for that polynomial, which you fix. 
I mean, I haven't thought about it, but that would be like the first thing that, that comes to mind. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, any further questions? Uh, yes, there's one here. Sorry. Um, <laughs> middle section, halfway back. Okay, <laughs> cool. Please go ahead. Um, so in your slide with the theorems, you said a statement that something like you believe average unitary SCK is larger than average unitary BQP because quantum SCK is larger than BQP or something like that. And I, since I'm not so familiar with SCK, I was hoping you could clarify on each side of your statement whether those containments are weak or strong. For example, like, do you know the weak containment and you believe the strong containment or do, do you not know the weak containment and just believe it? Um, so by weak and strong containment, you mean whether that's strict or not? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so, uh, okay, so I, I went back on my slides, but we, we didn't go back on the official slides, um, so you can't look at the theorem, unfortunately. Um, so um, BQP contains QSEK, um, that's a fact, and we believe the containment is strict, um, so meaning that there are problems in QSEK which are not in BQP. Um, of course, this does not, I mean, I, I want to stress that this fact alone, like if, if you believe this in decision complexity, it does not, um, like, you're not forced to believe anything about unitaries, but also, I mean, as usual in complexity theory, a lot of these beliefs are based on sort of looking at the definition and seeing what seems plausible and whether it seems like you should have more power. And unfortunately, I, like the definition of unitary SEK is too complicated to, to state, um, but basically it does give you access to an unbounded prover, and it does seem like that should give you strictly more power than what you could just do by yourself. So if these two were the same, you would basically have a statement that I by myself am as powerful as me with access to some kind of zero knowledge unbounded prover, which just doesn't, doesn't seem plausible. Okay, I think we have time maybe for one more question. Um, okay, I can see there's one. I, yeah, oh, yeah. Can I uh, ask here? Yeah, sure. Um, why do you restrict the inputs to be classical? Why don't you allow them to be just states? The unitaries to be labeled by states? Oh, um, so you mean instead of having like u sub x, have like u sub psi for some state? Yes. Psi? Um, you, I guess, could in principle. I'm not sure what that would buy you in terms of showing reductions. I'm also wondering whether you can kind of embed our definition into that by having some kind of, I mean, if like your size are orthogonal, um, you could just do the unitary that's like the sum of the projectors on the orthogonal states, hence so the corresponding unitary. Um, so I'm not sure it buys like you anything in terms of definitions, and I'm, I'm really not sure it buys you anything in terms of being able to show reductions, which is what we care about ultimately. Um, but you know, maybe it does, so maybe it's an interesting thing to, to study. We, we haven't thought about it. Thanks. Okay, so I think maybe in the interest of time, we might need to bring questions to an end there and uh, keep any further ones for the coffee break later. So let's thank Tony again for a really nice talk.